Um, I want to deliberately start with something that hasn't got anything to do with COVID at all. It's just about good practice. And good practice is the same today as it was last February, as it will be in September. And that's what I, that, this is something that I call the visitor attraction trilemma. So whether you're a zoo, a cathedral or the Royal Academy, these things still pertain. Um, <clears throat> and it's, the, it's a bit like the, um, the, the circus juggling act where you try and keep all the plates spinning at the same time and you have to keep one nudging before the other one falls off. Well, my equivalents are value, volume and visitor experience. So value is the money that you get in through the door, either through ticket sales or donations or sales for temporary exhibition or whatever it is. Volume, the number of people and the visitor experience, self-explanatory. But one of the things that is absolutely crucial to the keeping these three things in balance is that you can put a great deal of emphasis on one, but that's almost always to the detriment of something else. So it could well be that you increase your value by increasing your ticket price, but that could be at the expense of volume, you get less people. Or you could really go hard, as trustee boards are usually want to do, to get more people through the door. You know, continual um, object is about getting more people through the door. But that could be at the expense of the visitor experience, because the more people you get, actually, the more TripAdvisor negative reviews that you get, because it's more crowded and it's less personal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things that I think is, is always really important, even in a time of COVID, even in a time of recovery and reopening, is remembering the balance of these three things in order to achieve wise growth. And, and I'll come back to, to those in a, in a, in a second. Um, the second thing has also got nothing to do with COVID at all. And it's um, something that we've been doing at Alva for a number of years now. Uh, we publish our members annual visitor numbers for the previous calendar year. So at the moment, I've got them all for 2020. And as you can imagine, it makes for really stark, very depressing reading. And we're going to be publishing them in the media on the 31st of, of March, so just before Easter. And the press release, which, as you can imagine, has taken some agonising over, is, is really divided into three areas. One is the absolutely significant economic impact upon the museums and galleries sector and broader visitor attractions of COVID-19. And particularly those indoor attractions which have not been able to open for as long uh, as, for example, our visitor attractions. So one is the economic sig significance of losing that sector. The second is, despite that, uh, and whilst visitor attractions like museums and galleries were physically closed, they were digitally open. And so last year we saw an explosion of creativity in digital content. Uh, and I referenced some really good examples of that. And then the third is one of the things that we also saw was that when people did go back to visitor attractions, they loved them. And it was almost like falling in love again because uh, you suddenly realized how important they were to you. And, and so the third bit of that press release that we're gonna be putting out on the 31st of March is here's how you as members of the public can support your local favorite visitor attraction by becoming a member, um, by giving a donation if you can, by taking out a gift membership if you can, or by visiting when you, they're open, uh, or by going and spending money on their online shop if, if they have one. Um, one of the other things that we do when we collate all of the visitor numbers is look back behind the scenes to see if there are any common behaviours or common DNA uh, of those visitor attractions which have successfully and sustainably grown their visitor numbers. And unsurprisingly, there are, and they're these. So those visitor attractions, whether it's a zoo, a cathedral or an art gallery, those visitor attractions which have successfully and sustainably grown their visitor numbers have all of these characteristics in common. They're provocative, they're disruptive, 
they take risks, they stretch their brand, and they are genuinely interested in who comes, who doesn't visit, and why they don't, and doing something about it. So I'm going to come back to all of this because we've seen really good examples under COVID of people really demonstrating some of these DNA uh, characteristics. Um, right, I mean, literally this day last year, um, I wrote this. And it's really uh, been unchanged over the course of the last year. I remember, for those of you who get my tweets, first thing, I can only apologize. And, and two, um, uh, I can apologize for my behavior at Eurovision Song Contest. I just go tweet mad. Um, but if you saw one of my tweets last night, it was the fact that last night well, was one year to the day since I last had my physical in-person meeting. And it was a group convened by the Mayor of London. And it was about COVID preparatory and, and closure. And during the meeting, I got a text saying that all the London theatres would be cancelling their performances that night. So we're one year in, in terms of visitor attractions closing down. And one of the things that we committed ourselves to doing at Alva was to provide lots of clear information as clear as possible. Because there's been um, a huge amount of confusion, unreliable information, frankly, government U-turns, and we wanted to provide as much impartial, clear information as possible, not just for the Alva membership, but for the broader visitor attraction sector. So all of our research, all of our bulletins, all of our webinars, are open to absolutely everybody. And we also took a, a view that in the leadership role that we have at Alva, because of the nature of our members, we also wanted to be very generous in providing as much information as possible, but also representing the issues of members who are not, sorry, the issue of attractions who are not members of Alva. Um, and because we've got constant access to number 10 and Treasury and DCMS and Home Office, um, we thought it was incredibly important to use that leverage opportunity to, to really speak on behalf of the entire sector, uh, along with colleagues in um, AIM and, and elsewhere. Um, so some of the research that we've commissioned, I think you'll be familiar with. Um, so we commissioned primary research into public sentiment uh, last year and this year. And in fact, the latest wave of public sentiment research is going to be broadcast live on a webinar tomorrow between 12 o'clock and one o'clock. All the details are on our website. And if you get our bulletin, they're all in there as well. Um, and this tomorrow's will be significant because we've upped the number of people in London that we're asking questions of. And we're also asking London specific questions as well, in particular about indoor visitor attractions and theatres. Now, the timing of tomorrow's is really important because we went out into the field immediately after the 22nd of February. So immediately after the Prime Minister's announcement about the roadmap of reopening. So it does show that people, given that time scale of dates, unsatisfactory though they may be, they can see a light at the end of the tunnel. And there is tangible proof now of greater optimism on the part of the UK public and also of Londoners about leaving their house, and I'm not being flippant, there is a real sense of agoraphobia around about, I'm very uncomfortable about leaving my house and going beyond the shops. Uh, but there is a growing sense of confidence about coming back to visitor attractions. Um, also a degree of hesitancy about what the behavior of fellow members of the public are going to be like, not just at visitor attractions, but more broadly in the street, on buses, on tubes. All of that data is free and available on our website. So I just want to go through 10 things that we've learned from the course of, of last year uh, before I go on to government asks uh, and some predictions for reopening. But the first is, and this always happens, uh, the appreciation of tourism and culture, both in terms of the economy, but also our lives, uh, our health, our mental health, our physical health and well-being is never more appreciated than at times of crisis. 
So 20 years ago this month, we had the foot and mouth disease. Now that led to a, a loss of about eight billion pounds in the UK tourism sector. Also hit hard the, the farming sector, of course, but tourism is 14 times larger than farming to the UK economy. And so when it hit us, it hit us really badly. And that was my first experience of politicians really starting to understand the importance of tourism, culture, museums and galleries and the visitor attraction sector. And so because we've had, um, and I'll come back to this, as you can well imagine, because we've had nine secretaries of state for culture, media and sport in 10 years, just think about that for a second. Um, my job is a constant process of education of those ministers and secretaries of state about what tourism and the cultural sector means at local, regional, national levels. And so with that advocacy, we, along with others at Arts Council England and Society of London Theatres, were able to construct a, a 1.57 billion pounds cultural recovery fund, which eventually got the light of day from DCMS and from Treasury. And we've been able to supplement that with additional financial asks from the Treasury over the course of the last um, seven or eight months ago. But it does require a crisis, sadly, for the politicians to truly understand what we in this sector, everyone on this call, just lives and breathes and knows instinctively. The second is that we've also seen an explosion in the course of the last year of very generous sharing and collaboration within the sector and beyond the sector. And this is one of the things that I really hope will be a legacy issue, that that sharing and collaboration and reaching out and being supportive beyond your own natural network is something that will increasingly become the norm. And particularly at a time of financial vulnerability and question marks about funding models for museums and galleries, this nature of collaboration, in fact, this very network is a really good example of the kind of things that need to be continued for the sake and sustainability of the sector. The third, um, and if you know me and you've heard me speak before, you won't be surprised at me wanting to underline this, is the importance of front of the house staff. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had the chief exec of Airbnb come along to speak at an Alva conference. And he said that when Airbnb were putting together their business plan, one of the things that they looked at was TripAdvisor reviews. Now, you may know that the number one thing most reviewed on TripAdvisor isn't hotels or restaurants, it's actually visitor attractions. And so one of the things that they found, and I've subsequently checked and updated, and it's still the case, is that a five-star review, excellent, top review that you can get on TripAdvisor, a five-star review is four times more likely to mention a staff member's name than a four-star review, very good, i.e. the difference between a very good visitor experience at your museum and an excellent one is you and your colleagues, whether they're paid or volunteers, doesn't matter. So the importance of front of house staff in providing that welcome, saying thank you, saying goodbye, saying come again next Saturday, did you know that we have an event on, are you a member, would you like some membership information, all of that is absolutely crucial, not just in terms of economics and politeness, but actually in terms of repeat business. But this year and last year, the importance of front of house staff has never been more important because it's not just that they have been welcoming and have been enticing and inviting people through the door, but they've also been policing, wrong verb, but you know what I mean. They've also been policing cleanliness, um, sanitizing the site, face mask use, social distancing. So they've also had an additional, possibly more difficult role in managing the visitor experience to people's comfort and safety level, levels beyond that which they would normally do. Fourth, uh, I mentioned earlier on about the explosion in digital. You know, whilst visitor attractions were physically closed, they were digitally open. They were virtually open. And we've seen extraordinary work on the part of your digital colleagues 
in creating everything from virtual tours to lectures to behind the scenes, uh, downloadable jigsaws and recipes and gardening tips and I mean, absolutely everything that you can imagine. And I know that for many of the, your digital colleagues, they, they felt for the first few months of lockdown from sort of March onwards that the entire organization was kind of on their shoulders, that they were the very physical manifestation of the museum to the outside world through their digital content. And they were brilliant and they were creative and they took risks and they were knackered. And uh, I think they felt that their work was suddenly appreciated in a whole new way. And the digital content has been really rather extraordinary and, and it's had some quite surprising outputs and outcomes. One is um, visitors who don't traditionally come and cross your threshold. Um, we all know that um, despite our best public engagement efforts, that there are some communities and demographics um, that just don't feel comfortable about crossing your physical threshold, either because they won't see collections or stories that, that are about them in which they see themselves reflected, or that they won't see people bluntly who look like them, either as fellow visitors or members of staff, um, or they just feel th that it's not the kind of place for them. And that can be about ethnicity, but it can also be about poverty. And it can be about social exclusion, and it can be about lack of welcome. But one of the things that we have found is that because everybody has been online, um, there has been an increase in people who haven't traditionally cross the physical threshold of your visitor attractions, but have done so digitally. And what they found has been exciting. Now, here's the caveat to all of this. As brilliant as digital output has been, digital can complement, it can entice, it can excite, it can entertain, it can invite. But what it can't do is replace the actual visitor experience. It's an invitation to cross the threshold rather than a replacement for it. The next is, um, do we really want to open up in the same way that we close down? Bluntly. And acceptance, a critically honest process about what we did in the past wasn't perfect and we shouldn't try and replicate it once we reopen, we should recover better. We've absolutely found that people can in fact work at home. That was a complete revelation to everybody. We found that these Zoom meetings can work. We found that you don't have to be as bureaucratic um, or risk averse over the course of the last year. Let's import those new normal behaviors into our future behaviors when we reopen. Trying new things, fostering creative partnerships with unusual suspects to reach new audience in order that you can be critically honest about who does visit either your website or indeed your museum, who doesn't and why they don't. The next, and it follows on from this as a sort of natural segue, is this is an op opportunity to open our doors to people who are different from those we close them to right at the start of the first lockdown. If we simply reopen the doors of our museums and the same people that we closed them to last March, come back in, we've lost a year. We've lost an opportunity. We've, we've just rewound. So are there things that you've learned and experienced and tested and tried over the course of the last year that you now want to import as your new normal behavior? Here's a, here's a more whimsical one, but it, it does serve to to uh, underline uh, a, a point here. Um, we did a survey just before Christmas of all of our members and practically every one of our members has an online shop. And we asked them what were the top things that people bought from their online shops at visitor attractions under lockdown. And this is the list. Now, I think this is fascinating. It's also a very good pub quiz question. So number one, jigsaws. Jigsaw sales in the UK 
rose 200% and are now worth 100 million pounds. Number two, gardening tools and seeds. Number three, cake making and baking, particularly during Great British Bake Off. Number four, family board games, but, but not anything that involves a battery or a plug. So we're talking about Scrabble and Monopoly and Connect Four and um, battleships. Uh, local history books. So while people have been in lockdown, they've become more curious about where they actually live and the stories of people who are buried in the graveyard and where did the money come from for and what is the, the I live in Stockwell near Brixton. Uh, so what is the, where was the stock in Stockwell? What was the, where was the well in Stockwell? Um, you know, I've, I've discovered streets. I've been living here for 20 years. I've discovered streets in the last year that I've never been down, about four minutes walk from my house. It's, it's been revelatory and also embarrassing in equal measure. Um, local history books, ancestry kits. So genealogical tourism is absolutely no coincidence that one of the highest rated, rating TV shows was Long Lost Family under lockdown. And the BBC brought out a Long Lost Family lookalike called DNA something, which is pretty much long lost family. But it's about that sense of ancestry, because if the future is so unpredictable and scary, you seek some sort of reassurance about where you come from. So suddenly nostalgia is a really potent force. Spoiler alert, for good and evil, because there is honest nostalgia and toxic nostalgia. Animal adoptions, okay, not many people on this call, but if you're a zoo, you're fine. And then last, once you've got through that list, cocktail shakers and makers and recipe book, because you really need a Cosmo. Now, I, I think all of these things are really interesting because actually they're about memory making, experiences and simple pleasures, simple pleasures, which brings me to my next slide. The number one terrestrial, so not Amazon or Netflix, the number one TV program that's had the greatest percentage increase in viewers is BBC One's The Repair Shop. Now, if you don't know it, it's like the antithesis of Antiques Roadshow. So it's not about money, not about cash, but it is about value and it's about emotional value and it's about storytelling and it's about repairing things that are imbued with a story and a sense of history and emotions and love. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that's become the highest, um, the, the, the TV program with the greatest percentage increase in viewers, because it absolutely feels that it reflects what we've all been going through about sharing memories, making memories, uh, the value of simplicity, the value of storytelling that doesn't necessarily come attached with uh, a big price tag. And we as attractions, when we reopen, are really well placed to take advantage of this new interest in the stories and narratives and emotions behind stuff. Next is that when your favorite things are taken away, you suddenly appreciate how much you love them. So when visitor attractions did reopen, we saw an extraordinary um, expression of love. And I don't, I, I don't mean that you know, flippantly. Actually coming back to people's most important visitor attractions, whether it's Kew Gardens or, or whether it's a visitor, whether it's a museum or a gallery or a zoo or whatever it was, these, these places of huge emotional resonance for people was actually an emotional experience. And not just an emotional experience for the visitors, but an emotional experience for you and your colleagues and, and your staff. Um, one of my colleagues um, said that, you know, with the, with the revolving door syndrome of we're closing the museum again, we're reopening it, we're closing it again. Every time we close, it becomes logistically easier but emotionally harder. And particularly people who, who work in the museum sector, and I'm not going to over egg this, largely do so for vocational reasons. We could all be earning much more somewhere else. So there is that kind of vocational element. 
And once you remove people physically from their collections and their places that they love and their colleagues, that inevitably has trauma and turmoil. On the part of the visitor, we saw an expression, an explosion of expression of support. So really significant growth in membership retentions during lockdown. So people taking out or continuing their memberships of museums and galleries and attractions, even though they couldn't actually use them. Personal philanthropy. Uh, unprompted personal giving, so people just giving donations. But of course, the key here is ask as well, because people actually, if they have been in work for the last year, have got more disposable income now than they ever usually have. So ask them to give it to you. And there's also been a huge growth in volunteering as well. People in lockdown realizing that actually they want to give their time and possibly their money to places that are really emotionally significant to them. So we've seen a huge growth in volunteering at attractions. One of my mantras, um, and I don't apologize for repeating it so often, and it features a lot in my tweets, is sanitize your site, not the visitor experience. Of course, make sure your museum, your gallery is clean, it's hygienic, that you've got those two meter distancing, that everything is washed down, that you're being, that you're seen to clean by members of the public so they can actually see that you're doing all of this. But don't make it so clinical that it robs your place of joy. Because actually your museum or gallery is a place that people have been yearning to get back to. What they don't want to come back back to is essentially a hospital ward with stuff. So sanitize your site, of course, but don't sanitize the visitor experience. And then lastly, and it's a bit poetic, but um, I will say it, you and your colleagues create the backdrop for people's happiest memories. What a fantastic opportunity. Uh, and also what an awesome responsibility. And this time around, when people have been disconnected from their family and their friends, the places that they love, the experiences that they love, I think this year we're going to see an explosion in the experience economy. So people wanting to get together with their friends, their families, intergenerational groups, and create memories and have experiences together because they realize that's the most valuable thing. It's not something that you can buy on Amazon. And of course, you're brilliantly placed to exploit that, exploit in a good sense, to exploit that sense of you creating the backdrop for people's happiest memories. We have one significant uh, achievements in continuing the reduced rate of VAT at 5% until the end of September, and then it goes up to 12.5%. That was no mean task, let me tell you. Uh, I and Kate Nichols, Chief Executive UK Hospitality, had a really quite tough one hour three weeks ago with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury and uh, to uh, with the head of VAT uh, talking about this just prior to, to the budget. We also want the continuation of furlough and the continuation of the um, business rates uh, holiday extension. The reason being is that tourism was hit first, hit hardest, and will take the longest to recover. But even for those visitor attractions that can open, indoor attractions can open on 17th of May, it may not just be economically viable to do so because working at a very reduced capacity means that they're just not breaking even. And so we want them to have a level of support so that when they can reopen in a successful, sustainable and safe way, they're able to do so. Last is something that affects you more than it affects me because this is really about curatorial, is the government interference in curatorial decisions and storytelling, particularly around statues and the phenomena of Black Lives Matters. And then lastly, the financial vulnerability of the sector. We've seen attractions that have closed down over the course of the last year, but it's also thrown really the, a, a stark light on the funding models uh, in the museum sector, not just in London, but across the, the UK. 
In terms of London reopening now, um, we've created the London Tourism Recovery Board, which uh, I'm the co-chair of. The London Tourism Cooperative also exists. Whilst the board does tr strategic London branding work with London and Partners and Visit Britain, basically encouraging people to come back to London. The London Tourism Cooperative is a, as it suggests, a cooperative of, of individual businesses aimed at getting people onto their websites and then ultimately visiting their sites. So it's very much about tactical marketing and we work with them very closely. London and Partners is an agency of the mayor. So it and Visit Britain, an agency of government, are affected by the PERDA, PERDA restrictions. PERDA meaning um, that they cannot um, undertake what is perceived to be political activity during the period in the run-up to the mayoral elections and other elections across the UK. So PERDA in London starts on Monday. So you will not see mayoral announcements some even TfL announcements or London Partners announcements from Monday onwards about their activities or their planned uh, campaigns. We can still completely do that because we're independent uh, as a trade association, but it does affect the climate of decision making uh, over the course of the next five weeks or so. On April the 12th, Transport for London's marketing begins. Uh, and it's going to be using the strap line, we're here when you're ready. Um, and so really encouraging people to come back to tubes and buses and, uh, and overground. In April, domestic tourism advertising begins, the kind of thing that the London Tourism Recovery Board is going to be doing. On 6th is the mayoral election in May. On 17th of May is indoor reopening. And at least on June the 21st, at the earliest, full reopening of the entire economy. And what government have said to me is they expect that full reopening to exactly mean that, i.e. no social distancing inside buildings any, anymore. My own sense is that it would be good for you to assume that you need to have reduced capacity and some sort of social distancing for a good while over the summer. And then lastly, there will be a campaign around the June office return uh, and getting people back into their particularly central London workplaces. Um, this is just an example. I'm not going to go through it very quickly, but it's, I'm very happy for you to, to share it afterwards. This is the kind of information and data that we're using to inform our domestic marketing campaigns for London. So knowing what Londoners want to do when they're able to do so, where they want to go, um, if they're interested primarily in day trips or overnights, because we do know that there's a really strong demand on the part of Londoners and people who live within about a two hour commute of London, um, because they won't be going abroad on holiday this year, they are actively thinking about spending time in London. So how can we convert them um, from that level of interest into an actual sale? And we're getting loads of metrics and data and insights to inform our planning, um, including things like making sure that our messages are balanced around safety, enjoyment, trying new things, rediscovering, but most of all, come now to experience London in a way that you've never experienced it before. The quality of the visitor experience in going to a museum or a gallery or a zoo or a cathedral is unparalleled now because it is reduced capacity, there are no queues, there are no crowds, you can be upfront and personal with an animal or an artifact or a painting or a performance in a way that you've never been able to before and possibly never will again after this year. So grab the opportunity of experiencing London in a way that you've never done before. And then my last slide, um, and if I'm conscious of time, apologies. My, my last slide is what I think will be the great challenges for all, is, all of you as museum and cultural leaders in London. And the continuing challenge to listen to those who come and cross your physical threshold and to those who don't. To challenge yourself to be braver and bolder and take more risks, 
the appetite for risk has grown over the course of the last year when you've there's been a kind of increasing sense of let's just do it and have a go and you know speeded up decision making that wouldn't have been normally the case in normal times to be your own best advocate to demonstrate your own authenticity and to live your authenticity as a storyteller of truth and not just of accepted wisdom. Gather data and evidence because that has been the saving grace for me in my negotiations with Treasury and Number 10 and DCMS, showing the real economic impact of our sector um, with really good, absolutely substantiated, well-evidenced data. Um, and lastly, and again, not to be too poetic about it, but Attractions and museums and galleries in the cultural sector aren't just where you grow jobs, though we're very good at it. We're the third largest industry in the UK, fifth largest employer. But museums and galleries are also where you grow people in terms of their curiosity about the world, in terms of their understanding of how they fit into community and, and civics, about how they can give back and not take. Uh, about the true story of our nation and where we sit in the world. So they are places of growth and challenge and provocation and disruption and risk and entertainment and education. And they're also the places that provide the backdrops for people's happiest memories. And that's never been more important than it has been this year.